So moving on, we now have a short paper and this is called In, I like the title here, In, Out, Shake It All About, an experience of moving a library and archive during COVID-19. That just sounds, well, it sounds full of fraught with challenge and stress. So um, I'm delighted that we've got um, Jennifer Hilliard, um, Library and Archives Manager um, from the Common Room. It's interesting because I was going to say the Mining Institute, but obviously things have moved on. So um, she's going to have a chat and, and tell us all about this. Again, if you've got questions, put them in the chat. Make sure you're tweeting as well, you know, um, bring this to life. So, Jenny, are you out there? I am. I am. Always. Oh, hello. Right. So I am going to switch my video off and uh, switch my camera off and let you tell us all about this. Thank you, Biddy. Um, as you can tell from the title, it, it was a lot like doing the hockey cocky at times, I think, with um, having it all. It really should be out in and shake it all about, I think, really. But there you go. OK, um, so this is an image of the lovely wood hole. Um, but just looking at it, you can see the challenges there of getting the books in and out. Uh, next slide, please. So for context, um, we had a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant um, and to, in order to try and make the building fully wheelchair accessible. So to all, all rooms on all floors um, and that would enable us to do wider engagement activities with, um, with everyone that we wanted without having to make apologies for our uh, grade two star listed, very inaccessible building. Um, we also needed just to make it fit for purpose. Basically we had had years of complaints of people freezing to death in the lecture theatre and struggling with only two ladies lose because the building was not set up to have many ladies toilets in it, as you can imagine being the Mining Institute. Um, and to generally just future proof the building in terms of the Wi-Fi, the plug sockets. I mean, I was running the entire thing from two plug sockets and many, many daisy chained extension leads at one point. So, you know, just the basics like heating, lighting, power um, but we took it further than that to future proof it with the ability to do things like li live streaming discussions from all the rooms and screens and or all sorts of things um, one of our first steps along the road was to create this new inst new institution the common room um, because that we people keep asking me oh have you renamed it's like no 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 the mining institute still very much exists they're a royal chartered body they have their own lecture program they have their own uh, office within the building and they will continue to operate out of the building for as long as they exist. Um, but we needed a, a name for the new charity that was gonna manage the front of house stuff, um, run the cafe bar, uh, run the events program, run the weddings and run the engagement and the program and everything else. So we did this massive tupee process where we all transferred across um, and now everything belongs to the common room, all of the, the, the old Mining Institute collections and everything as well. So that was how we, how we did it. Next slide, please. Um, it was a long process, very, very long, because you think you're there when they say to you in, in our case, June 2018, yes, yes, you've got the money and we all quietly celebrated, um, but we weren't actually allowed to spend any money until the November, which as you can imagine is a challenge. Um, particularly given we had great exhibition of the north in the middle there where we had 30,000 people through the doors that summer it was a great tester of what it was going to be like post post event but it was quite challenging trying to pack amongst that many people um, so we got our permission to start through um, we um, started the packing um, it took us till March 19 to get the final stuff off to storage um, and then lockdown came along. And so we were delayed probably about an extra six to eight months, I would say, on top of our original plan. Um, but it was more how it changed the plan than how it delayed it, as, as we'll see. So on we go, please. Next one. There was a lot of planning, as you can imagine. Um, we had an internal collections advisory group with people from other local universities that helped me out a lot. And uh, so Liz, the conservator from Durham University, and uh, one of her colleagues who was involved with digitization at Durham, um, and then Liz Reese, the uh, who had been the head at Tynemuir Archives and Museums, 
all these different local experts who very kindly gave me their time for free um, to give me the advice I needed as a solo information professional working to do something I'd never done before. Um, I obviously did a lot of online research as well, looking into other people who'd done similar moves. Um, John Ryland's university had done a wonderful write-up that I found extremely useful. And I also contacted other local similar organisations who'd moved, like the Great North Museum Hancock, to say, who did you use and what did you learn? And everyone was so helpful and so willing to share their expertise. Um, this British Library Preservation Advisory Centre booklet became my Bible for large portions of that time. Uh, they're downloadable free PDFs. If you're contemplating a move, I would highly recommend you get it. Uh, next one, please. Um, so the first thing it said was you need to put your stuff in crates. So I went off and investigated crates. Um, there are many sizes. It got quite challenging. As you can see, it took a lot, 800 in, in total, actually, um, which, yes, uh, it was a lot. <laughs> um, I had challenges in that they wanted them to have, um, the British Library booklet is insisting that they ought to have um, a solid bottom so you couldn't possibly have any water come up through into them, if that makes sense. Um, my solution, given that the only ones our company could offer uh, did not, was simply we insisted that they shelved them all at least three metres off the ground. Um, I felt if the water had got any higher than that, then we had a bigger problem than just the bottoms of the crates getting wet. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, yes, some of the stuff that I already said. So, um, yeah, we, there was a weight limit on them as well. That was the challenge. So you had a 25 kilo limit as to what, how heavy the removals company was willing to let you have them great be. And you had to obviously include the weight of the crate in that. Um, so we tried to stand the books upright like they were on a shelf um, as the following the advice and then just to use additional things to pack out the space, which we had some spare acid free boxes that we used until we ran out of those. Um, we also used um, empty files, um, empty jiffy envelopes, bubble wrap, scrunched up paper, all sorts of things. Um, and we carefully labeled each one with three numbers on each crate because I was determined we were not going to end up with any unnumbered crates at the end of the game. Uh, we did have a spreadsheet that listed the start and end shelf mark of what was in each crate, even though we had said that we were not offering a retrieval service while we were closed at all. Um, I did still really want to know, just in case somebody came to me saying, it'll be the end of my dissertation if I can't possibly see such and such. Uh, you know, if it had been that sort of state, we would have tried to get the book for them. So I did want to know, even though I wasn't advertising this option. Um, that picture is a crate with the 25, with the 20 kilos worth of stuff in it, uh, but before we put the packing material in, and you can see what I mean, that you end up with a row and a bit, and then you need to be able to pack that last space out. Next one, please. Challenges. Yes, there were many. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Uh, this is the first one, balconies. Um, the majority of the main monograph library stock is on balconies accessed by metal spiral staircases. Anyone who's tried carrying a box down a spiral staircase will know it is impossible. You can't see your feet. Um, I can just about do it because I now know exactly where the steps are. They're kind of ingrained into me after this many years in the building. Um, but I certainly was not prepared to ask anybody else to carry a box down those stairs, whether it was a removal professional, a volunteer or a member of staff. It was just it was not going to happen. Um, so we needed to think of another way. The mining engineers amongst the group um, were thinking about various conveyor options. Um, but they weren't terribly keen to help me build one, which was disappointing. Um, and they are mainly retired mining engineers and didn't really have as much kit to hand as, as they would have done once upon a time. Um, and I did also look into roofing tile conveyors as well, but they did, were all really designed to be outside mainly. It was, it was a tricky situation, but we did dissolve it. So onto the next slide. Uh, we built a book slide. So this is a piece of tarpaulin. Uh, which my mum very kindly sewed for me on her overlocker to make two channels down either side. And then you thread a drain pipe down the, the two channels to make it more rigid um, and then tie it on using book tape at the top and the bottom. And ta-da, 
book slide. Um, we slid every book down that way. There were a few really chunky ones that we didn't. And I will say that before we started this process, we did go and do a complete shelf check of the whole lot um, and make sure that any that were damaged came down separately and were face boxed and put back on the shelf to come down via the book slide later. So this was very much the prep work that we were doing in that summer when the exhibition the North was on. There was a lot of shelf checking went on at that point as well. And also making sure everything was in the right order on the basis of it would be easier to put it back if we packed it in sequence. Um, but yeah, that book slide was amazing. It took several tarpaulings in over the whole time. I will issue that warning because the sharp corners on a book, particularly the face boxed ones, did eventually catch on the, the tarp where there was a slight ridge. So we got through about four of them in total, I think. But they're very cheap from tool station. So it was fine. Um, yeah, the fun of doing these things on a budget as always. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, so even if we had been able to fill the crate on the balcony, we wouldn't have been able to lift it because 25 kilos, it's not light. I mean, it's, it's a two person lift, that's okay. But certainly as a single person lift, that was not going to happen. Um, but, and also we needed to know what the weight of the crate was going to be. So next slide, please. So what we did was we um, slid the books, the books came down the book slide, as you can see there, and then you've got the empty crates sat on the parcel scales um, that you have to make sure that they um, are zero before you put the crate on. We had a few went wrong there. Um, and then you filled the crate until it was, I hit the 25 kilos. And then two volunteers, one either end, lifts it off along the table to the next volunteer you can see there, who's stuffing the packing materials into the ends of the crate to make sure that it's actually full. And then at no point do you actually carry the crate. We just push them along these tables um, all the way along um, and used um, bits of drain pipe to then extend the legs of the table to get it out to the next, uh, across the steps. So we had a table that had two normal length legs and two really long legs, and that got it over the step. But we basically just shunted them along tables a lot. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, we didn't have a lift in the building. That was part of what we were doing the whole thing to try and overcome the fact that our building was inaccessible. Well, that's great. Well, then you need to get 800 crates out. So we bought this fantastic device here, which is called a Genie. Um, and basically it's a, uh, a wind. You just uh, turn the handles on the top um, and you can wind the crates up and down. It's a lot easier winding stuff down than up because you've got gravity on your side, obviously. Um, so it was it was good that it was the out that we didn't have the lift for because we were working with gravity all the way. Thank goodness. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you can see that's the platform of the hoist coming up to my modified for mica table, so that we can just slide the crate over that little gap onto the platform. And then you drop the platform down, put the next one on, drop it down, put the next one on, all the way down until you've brought your stack down down from the, the balcony level. Uh, next slide, please. We actually bought the Genie hoist, by the way, um, and then sold it on to somebody later on and got all our money back. So rather than pay to hire it for the period, we actually uh, bought and then resold it. Um, so as well as books, I also had to contend with all of the objects and all of the paintings. The snag um, with the objects were a lot of bespoke boxes mainly. Some of them were ridiculous sizes, shapes, all sorts of things. Um, we reused a lot of old mount board from previous exhibitions from the Great Exhibition of the North. Um, so I'm glad I didn't throw that out. We were able to cut it into pieces to use to put in front of the glass, if you imagine, and also on the back where there were fixings and things that stuck out. Um, and then we, we used a lot of tape and things like that to sort that out. Um, I, we also took a lot of photographs of them before we did it and also carefully made sure we had accurate measurements for both the picture and the framed picture, if you see what I mean, um, which came in extremely handy later. Very glad I did that. Um, this did all have the added challenges of working at heights. Uh, we are lucky enough to own our own scaffold tower, um, which came in extremely handy at this point. Um, I'm not a fan myself. I can get up there. Not a great fan of being that high up, and I certainly can't let go with both hands. So I'm a bit limited on what I can achieve when I get there. Um, this is where the mining engineers came in very handy because they didn't seem to mind so much being up there. Um, it was tricky um, and the specialist contractors that are available to deal with hanging and 
de-rigging paintings. There aren't that many of them are out and sometimes you have to wait quite a while to get them. So that was a problem. Next slide, please. Um, down in the strong room, uh, this is the before. So you've got wooden shelving with uh, Victorian plate glass sliding doors that didn't often slide in some cases. Um, and such joys as a heating pipe with the, the, like an active part of the heating system that ran through the shelves um, that with water, hot water in it, um, that I'd had to lag to try and hope that that would prevent the heat damaging the books. Um, but we had got on really well with the phase boxing, as you can see there, we'd done lots of protective boxes and lots of wrapping of ones that we couldn't box. And we'd done a full preservation survey where each individual item from the core archives had been looked at, assessed, um, and then where, need, where it needed it, boxed. Um, and we checked it, that it was all there. So we'd basically done a full audit of what was actually in the room before we packed and moved, which was useful when you had that where is it? Did we lose it in the move? Oh no, we didn't have it before we moved, moment afterwards. Uh, next slide, please. So I did a lot of work with the design team about what the new strong room would look like, because obviously this was my, my key thing in the, in the thing. Um, in terms of my lessons learned, skirting boards, ah, um, they made a ridiculous, we carefully did this uh, shelving layout that you can see there on the left with roller racking and then shelving, fixed shelving around the edge of the room. Um, and we, the guy from the suppliers even came out and measured the room at the point that we were at where it had been sort of plastered out and it was now one space because it had been two rooms we'd knocked together. Um, and he came out and looked at it and everything. What we didn't know was that they were about to clag some skirting board on afterwards that has made some interesting moments. So if you're ever doing this, yeah, talk to them about that one. Um, I also had trouble with the pipes coming out of the new dehumidifier. They didn't tell me enough about where they were going to be. And we had problems with light switches and the button for the emergency gas suppression like hold off button. Again, where nobody thought to mention that where that was going to be in advance. Um, the security cameras also positioned quite badly, really, in terms of the shelving positioning. We're going to have to get those moved slightly. Um, we did win on the, the lighting direction thing. They thought to come and ask me about which way the shelves went so that you could put the lighting at the opposite way, if that makes sense. Um, however, all of my plug sockets ended up behind shelves initially, so they, they had to move as well. And I had to fight to get it taken off the main master key. Because as you can imagine, you don't want your strong room on that because um, if a builder or somebody comes in to do some work, the easiest thing to do is to hand them a master key. But you don't really want to be handing them the key that will get them into the archives room for somebody that you've, you've never met before. Um, so we've now switched the barrels over so that it's separate. Um, but again, if I'd known about that beforehand, that would have been something I'd have asked about. Uh, next slide, please. But this was my opportunity to have the dream shelving. After years of fighting with um, all of the um, wooden shelving and the sliding doors, it was great. Um, it was tricky though, because before you pack, I packed it, I really needed to do an awful lot of weighing and measuring. Because when you're doing the supplier bit, where they're asking you about what shelving you're gonna get, they want to know about how many meters, how many, at what heights and what um, depths and all that kind of thing and being really clear with them about whether it is boxes or ground volumes and all the books are just heavier. It's unbelievable. Some of the weight, um, the, the shelves just bowed. They had to send um, additional um, reinforcement bars to go underneath because the 1.2 meter shelves were just, just bending, um, particularly where I had um, a mixture of depths within a shelf. So obviously you don't want to necessarily shelve something by the physical size of it. You want to shelve it in a row with the other things in that collection. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, we had other considerations um, about the backs of the shelving, the fronts of the shelving, where will things fall out? Um, and where will the trip hazards become? Um, you can see here, we've got a lovely little gap of, that's just the width of your foot down the side. Some of this was a COVID problem in that we couldn't actually physically get on site to look at this when it was being put in because we were still in a sort of lockdown period where we weren't allowed to be there. If we'd actually seen it in person, we'd have obviously said, you know, I'll oh, just extend that out to the edge of there. Well, we weren't there. Um, I also had trouble with the ends of the shelving and not being the same as the mid pieces, if that makes sense. 
in terms of being able to line up a shelf across to make sure you were level. Um, and the thing I didn't buy that I wish I could have afforded was those lovely pull-out shelves that you can have um, within the racks so that you've got a pull-out shelf when you want to actually just quickly look at something without taking it off the table. Um, and attached lighting would have been another step further. But again, not something you could actually afford, but it, tempting. Yeah, if you can, it is worth it. Next slide, please. Dehumidifiers. So this is the argument between passive and active management of a space. So the new uh, trend, if you like, in um, environmental monitoring and management is towards passive, where you just make sure that the space is naturally uh, stable in itself. My trouble was I couldn't risk it not being stable enough and then never, ever, ever being the money there again to buy the dehumidifier. So while we had the funding, I got one on the basis of I didn't have to turn it on. Um, we'll have this dehumidifier, it's there as an option. Naturally, the room's about 50% on its own anyway. It doesn't really need it, but I needed to, to buy it at this point where I had the opportunity. Um, if you are buying one, uh, think about the where the control panel is. As you can see, I needed a remote unit fitting to find so that I didn't have to balance on the top of the steps and try and peer at the top of that unit and ask about the servicing frequency and the costs and the replacement of filters as well. If you've already got a dehumidifier on site, uh, that's running, make sure you change the filters a lot more while they're doing the building work. Don't ask me how I found that one out. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, here's a list of our suppliers, um, just in case anybody's interested in tracking any of them down or need some information about them. So I thought I'd include those for you as a record. Next slide, please. And this is us returning to the building. So we had the crate sequencing pretty much worked. Uh, I was planning to use a human chain to pass stuff back up the balcony, one on the floor, one on the ladder, one on the balcony, one at the shelf. That did not go with two meter distancing, unfortunately. Um, so the human chain plan was out, but in we had a number of unemployed musicians because uh, they we happened to have a lot of friends who were in bands and things who couldn't really work at that point. And so we had them uh, shifting books. And they did incredibly well, actually. Uh, we also had an added challenge in terms of my daughter there in the buggy, um, and no nursery, no problem. Um, she spent a lot of time running around crates. Um, and while all of this was going on, we had people on offsite working on various transcription and metadata projects as well. So the volunteers who would have been involved in the move weren't left out, if you like. They were still involved in the project just on a different angle and had been doing that right through the lockdown. Um, the main lesson I learned was to allow for more, I should have allowed a lot more space in each section when I put the books back. I didn't allow for the number of collections that people have been hanging on to at home, just waiting for us to get moved and to get post COVID to send them in to me. <laughs> so I have had to juggle the shelves a little bit since then, unfortunately. Uh, next, shelf, next slide, please. And my final top tips, take many photographs, many, many photographs, and then take some more at every single stage. The number of times I've been going back through my phone looking for a photo to know what something looked like before. So much. Uh, I got really saved by one volunteer who had happened to go around taking lots of photographs just because that was what he did. They came in so incredibly handy. Um, the spreadsheets of the book um, crates uh, look after your version naming um, and do many backups. We were okay, but we nearly weren't. Um, you have to accept that there will always be a miscellaneous box on the end. With this kind of scale, there was more than one miscellaneous box on the end. That's inevitable. It's painful, but just kind of had to go with it. And finally, if you put something into what you think mentally is a very safe place, write it down. Two years later, you will not remember where that is. I am still looking for the spare shelf clips for the wood hole. I know I put them in a very safe place. I have no idea where that was. Um, and yes, plan for at least a week off after it's done, both both the out and the in, you, you will need it by then. I'd accrued about a week and a half's blue time by the end of the event. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is the finished article, if you like. So this is post, post refurb. And yes, we do do tours. Um, and the next slide. And um, yes, that's the outside of the building. Now it's all shiny and cleaned up. Um, I think I'm probably quite tight on time for questions, but yes, we do do visits. Um, the volunteers I use were the ones I already had because I had quite a big volunteer team. 
Um, so as a special collections library, you do tend to have more volunteers. It's sort of more normal than it is in other library environments, I guess. Um, so we used the ones we already had. We recruited a couple of extras, um, including one wonderful guy who'd done a lot of um, previous library moves for his librarian mother. So he came pre-trained, he was great. Um, and yes, the climate change, by climate change mitigation, I'm wondering if you mean about the active passive thing that I was talking about before, perhaps. Um, but yes, we absolutely do visits. We will probably do a Sillip Northeast visit at some point, I would imagine, to do a tour around. Um, but we also do general public ones, just have a look at the what's on section of our website and they pop them up at intervals. That's great, Jenny. Thank you very much. I was going to, I was going to ask you the questions, but you did that yourself. So that's brilliant. And um, I think we'd all love a visit. So uh, I'm certainly uh, quite intrigued to come down and have a look. And I remember touring around years and years ago. So it'd be nice to come back and, and see it in all its finery. And, you know, and, and as we look around, appreciate all the, the hassle and the innovation. You know, your <laughs> mum and the tarpaulin, brilliant. She's good. She's very good. <laughs> all That's the, very was, impressed. It was very definitely a full family event. <laughs> yeah multiple generations so that was lovely thank you very much that was really really interesting and i think we all enjoyed that 